All right, folks, like I said, this isn't a movie. This is real life. This actually happened. Mac McDaniel on the stand, one of the victims in the Leon Jacob murder for trial hearing, uh, uh, sorry, trial that's happening in Houston. I'm here along, and you could probably hear him. He's a little loud. Eddie Hayes, uh, famous uh, criminal defense attorney and also former prosecutor. Homicide. Homicide. Tell me your reaction to this case, Eddie. Horrible. I mean, why would you go to somebody? In the first place, why would you do it? You're a doctor. How mad can you be at a guy to hire somebody to kill him? Well, here's why. Because he thought this woman was about to spoil his fortunes and get him uh, in trouble for an assault and stalking. It's all right. Go back to work. <laughs> I mean, you're killing somebody. You're in a lot of trouble. And he's hiring a guy he never saw before. It's not like they're gangsters and you're going to hire a guy to kill somebody and you know him or you and know you'd him. know something about gangsters right. and if the most important thing to hire a killer is he's got to know that if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do he'll get killed and right? this guy didn't know that he doesn't know anybody he doesn't know anybody involved he's like donald trump donald trump goes into the crime business with people he never saw before so, so your advice if you're going to hire a hitman make sure that hitman knows that he could be killed if he doesn't absolutely okay. try to hire a hitman that you know <laughs> Knows people that you know. And We're gonna get in big trouble here giving advice on how to hire <laughs> and, and he knows if he gets out of line, bang, he's gone. Right in the river. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so listen, you're defending this case, Eddie Hayes. What do you do? Find some way to. Oh, this guy has got no defense at all. They recorded him with these conversations with the hitman, right? They did. I don't know. <laughs> Looks a little tough. Make sure. What would I do? Make sure I get the retainer. That's the thing. <laughs> Make sure I got paid. <laughs> All right. Let's continue to listen to this because I want to take us to Frank Quinn. He is with the Harris County Police Department, and he is actually the one that goes and delivers the news to Leon Jacob and Valerie McDaniel that their loved ones were dead. But remember, their loved ones weren't actually dead because this was an all a setup by these undercover police officers. Let's take a listen to Frank Quinn's testimony. Um, now, let's take you back to the, to the day before at Olive Garden. Based on the information you'd received from Officer Duran, because you weren't listening live to the conversation, were you? No, sir. Uh, did you believe at that time that you have probable cause for the charge of solicitation? For the basic elements, yes, sir. For the elements of the office, the basic elements? Correct. And why is it that you wouldn't stop the investigation at that point? Well, really, we need to see an investigation fully through. Well, we bring charges to a district attorney, and we expect a jury to hear it. We want them to be able to see that investigation from the very beginning to the end. If we can take you along with us and let you stand shoulder to shoulder, in our endeavor, then you'll get a better yes, picture. Not responsive. You can continue. You'll get a better picture of what's happening. We want, you don't know us. So it's better for you to see it other than have to depend on what we're telling you. You can see it, you can interpret yourself. We have that ability now. We haven't always had that ability. So when we have it, we should use it. Okay. I'll, I'll move on. Um, so back to. March 9th, you have obtained arrest warrants for both Valerie and Leon, Valerie McDaniel and Leon Jacob. What was the plan or what was the reason for the call placed from Officer Duran to the defendant in an attempt to get him to come to a separate location? Well, Leon Jacob had said that he would come and inject Megan himself when in, in, that would, with an injection that would kill her, inject her into the heart. So we wanted to lure him out and arrest him away from there. We would have additional evidence if he came up with the poison, or whatever concoction he was going to use, and then we could arrest him safely without the presence of the daughter. I had told the family from the get-go, the McDaniels, that we would try to do this the best of our ability <clears throat> not to harm the girl or not to make sure, to make sure no harm came to the girl. Also, question and answer. At least with Leon Jacob, you wanted to affect the arrest in an environment where Valerie's daughter was not present. 
Okay, we are listening to Frank Quinn. He was one of the lead detectives in this case where basically the cops were involved in setting up uh, this undercover operation where Leon Jacob, the defendant in this murder trial, uh, attempted murder trial, I should say, that was going on out uh, of Houston area, actually tried to hire a hitman who he didn't know was actually an undercover police officer. Uh, they then went forward, Eddie Hayes, who's my uh, esteemed guest with me here, to uh, stage photos, and we can show these photos yeah. of what these two victims look like. So here's my question. If you have this guy on tape saying that he's trying to hire a hitman and let's, get, let's offer, why go forward with having to stage these photos of the two victims looking like this? It seems a little elaborate to me. Well, first of all, Quinn is obviously a brilliant witness and a brilliant investigator. The, the, fa the defendants... These aren't real dead people, by the way. This is fake, so right. don't be alarmed. All right. The, one is a doctor, and the other was his girlfriend. They would have access to substantial resources to defend themselves. And like he just said on the stand, there's no substitute for being able to show a jury the most powerful possible evidence. The other thing is it's a hideous crime. Dear God, I mean, you're going to kill him for, for basically money. I mean, it's not, you know, and uh, he wants to, he wanted to make sure that it was, the investigation was as thorough as possible. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. If it wasn't for crime, there wouldn't be any Irish guy with a job in the whole the country, <laughs> the whole United States. <laughs> so, so as we look at this case, you're Leon Jacobs' defense attorney. Do you let him take the stand? No. Because he's not, he, first of all, he's a creep. That's his first problem. Second of all, He's a creep. You can't put him on a stage. He's, he's awful, the guy. And, he, and he's so uh, self-indulgent and I, I don't know how you defend the case. Do you think he's like an egomaniac? Because the fact he thought he could get away with this says to me this guy doesn't really take direction. So if you're his <laughs> defense attorney, like, you know, you can't really control him. I, I don't know how you defend this guy. I mean, if you could get any kind of plea for him at all, all right, uh, I would take it. Now, early on in this case, I might say, and will you testify against your girlfriend? Because the guy obviously has no morals at all, so he doesn't care who he testifies against. But she killed herself, so uh, this guy's case is hopeless. Can, is this a death penalty case, Rachel? No, because it's a solicitation for attempted murder, so it is not. Right. Life, can he get life? Yes, he can. Life without parole? I believe so, yes. No. I'd, if I was the judge, he gets life without parole twice. I mean, yeah, I don't want to see this guy out of but, jail ever. But what about this entrapment uh, defense? It's garbage. Why yeah. is that? Because he keeps meeting with people. He meets with the, he discusses it. He meets with the undercovers. He meets with this guy, Quinn, and comes back and says they're dead. It's a pattern of behavior. There's no entrapment. And then we also heard from another witness earlier who was a paralegal uh, in a law firm from a family friend that he knew, and he actually got her involved in this, and she testified to the fact that he stalked her, um, that he insistently called her, that he this asked the paralegal? Her, the paralegal. Jeez, don't date this guy. Wow. Let's continue to listen to some <laughs> of this testimony from Frank Quinn with the Harris County Police Department. So you are obviously aware of the, in the scenario by which Mac was supposed to have been killed, and you said it yourself, a robbery gone wrong. Yes, sir. And the plan was to inform Valerie and the defendant of that plan during the, what's called a death notification, right? It was. We could inform Valerie, but we couldn't let her know that we knew Leon was there because we wouldn't know that. So everything had to appear normal and had to flow normal. We had to just go in there and tell her we're delivering a death notification for her husband and then see what her reaction was. And you want to get the reaction, number one, uh, but at this point you are inside the apartment. It's an easier way to effect a safe arrest, correct? It is. Okay. Now, the, the interactions you had, and, and by now we've moved into the early morning hours of the 10th of March, right? Yes, sir. At that time, when you all came into, into the uh, the apartment, when you knocked on the door, do, do you recall who answered? Uh, yes, sir. Valerie answered. And were you let inside the apartment? Yes, sir. We were. And was the entire interaction, uh, not only between you and Valerie, but you and the defendant, as well as other officers, was that recorded? It was, sir. Uh, was it recorded by yourself or another officer present? 
We, uh, it was recorded on the body cameras of the uniformed officers present that we brought up there. And have you reviewed the recording of the, the events of that evening when you were inside that apartment, along with Valerie McDaniel and the defendant? Yes, sir, I have. And is Hi, I'm Lise Wheel with you here. Uh, we, are in, we are hearing fascinating testimony from the lead investigator, Frank Quinn, in the Leon Jacobs case. This is the uh, doctor out of Houston uh, in the murder for hire case. Um, boy, I sound a little strange if I say I just love murder for hire cases. Oh, God. <laughs> I know, I, I know it sounds strange, but from an investigative standpoint, they have everything. I mean, a murder for hire case, because you take it out of just a, a straight murder case, right? You, you're in an extra element if you actually have to go out and hire somebody. So you bring in someone else into your horrible, insidious plan. You bring in somebody else to that and you actually, you know, putting money to that. You've got to hire somebody. You've got to trust somebody else. So you bring into this awful web that you weave. And of course, it did not, thank goodness, work out for this defendant in this particular case. I have with me, as you heard him in the studio here just a second ago, sticking with me, thanks, thank goodness, Ed Hayes here. Um, we just heard the lead investigator in this um, in this trial go on. Tell us, tell me what First you were all, thinking great. about him. Okay, First why, why, great. why do you say that? Very thorough, uh, very concerned, thinking about what he can do to impress a, a jury, not just what I can do as a police and what I can do as a witness first. Critical. Second of all, another thing is, if you look at his face, look at his eyes. This man has really hard eyes. If he says to you, if you move, I'll shoot, you better believe it. I, um, I had a gulp when you said that. I was like, okay, He's I'm listening. He's a very, very competent guy. It was a major case. They didn't assign it to him by accident. He's a terrific witness. I was super impressed with the guy. As far as the crime, why would a doctor a guy with everything in front of him who apparently has the capacity ah. of attracting lovely women go out and commit Ed, murder. Ed, 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 you are thinking like a logical person <laughs> thinks, all right? <laughs> Someone who would commit murder and then go beyond that. Someone who could commit murder for hire that is planning that murder and then bringing in, as I said, a third party Strangers. to commit that murder, a st stranger in this case, and this case actually someone who is posing as someone who would be actually willing to commit the murder. That takes a special, and I, I say this, intelligence <laughs> in quotes. Or lack of. <laughs> to do it, your words, absolutely. Um, I have to say when I was a federal prosecutor in the Western District of Washington State, murder for hire was my expertise. Really? Yes, it was. Now that there were so many murder for hires going on, but there were, but enough well, so that that became, if there were, yeah, if there were enough, if there's something came into my office and there was a murder for hire happening, or it was, you know, looking like that's what it was going to be, I was, you know, call wheel. She's the murder for hire expert. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've represented a lot of murderers and I have a couple of good friends that are murderers oh. and contract Remind kills. Remind me not to go to your house for dinner. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, I have one good friend who's a contract killer. They kill people with, they have partners or they hire people to do killings. They do it together. They know them. They've right. been in business with them, you know, had some relationship right. with them. He's hiring two guys he never saw before to kill somebody. Which yeah, is not I got the nothing to do. Thing. You got nothing to do this afternoon. Right. Clip right. this guy. Right, you know, right, right. It's like, come on. And also, um, you know, not that I want to give tips out for people out there would be murder for hire <laughs> kit. You know, let's not do that. But the the price was not all that high. What did he eighteen hundred dollars? Get out of here. No, for the first, well now fairly for the first installment and then a couple of watches. Now I have to tell you I'm not a big watch fiend or person. What kind of watches were they? Uh, I have it was wait, they were they were car, like fancy watches. Um, let me get it here. It's a gold uh, Rolex. Yeah, no, it was not a Rolex. It was up to, I, I think it was fancy. It was Cartier uh, two Cartier Cartier watches. So those are fancy, yeah, right? Yeah, wait, but those are those are yeah, but I but not from the from the Cartier shop. You know where you go in and there's a Cartier pop up shop in your local in your local mall. I'm sure. Is, so they're used. But eighteen hundred dollars as the first installment of a twenty thousand dollar contract. Twenty thousand dollars 
uh, is really not all that high on the market for murder no. for hire. The other thing is, no real killer would one take watches, especially for women. Right, because, exactly. Right. You and want two, cool hard cash. And, and two, you would never take eighteen hundred dollars. Right. Because how are you going to get the other eighteen thousand? Exactly. Right? Exactly. So you because want once the least, murder is done, you're not going to get that money. Right. So you need at least half down, exactly. half down, and half there after it's done. Yeah. And you got to say to the guy, if I don't get paid, you're dead. You know what, Ed? This is making me a little nervous because I feel like we're giving it like <laughs> as again, I say the, the kit for somebody to do it. But, um, right, this is, this is, and this was now, he had gone through seven, got several gyrations to get to this, quote, uh, murder for hire who was going to do it. But by that point, of course, it was a setup to him, um, you know, to, it was, a, it was a setup for the feds. Um, and, the reason that, that they actually got to the feds was the person that he had gone to, again, now he'd gone through several people to get to a murder for hire, went to the feds and said, look, the gig Wait, is, the gig is up. up. He tried to hire a couple of other people to do the killing, or he went to people and said, can you find me a guy to do the killing? He, no, he went to a person to find or try to find a killer. He'd gone to an, he went to one individual. That individual disappeared after he paid him $10,000, and you can see where this goes. We're going to go back to the investigator now to hear a little bit more of what he has to say. And we're getting very close to the end of the prosecution's case. Um, after that, we'll go to the defense, but we still have more from the lead investigator. Let's go back to see what he has to say. Who is it that we see, and in, in, who, who are the gentlemen we see here? That's uh, Sergeant Pete Schneider, and okay. that's just a building security there. And is that you? Correct, that's me. Did you encounter any issues in getting in the building in regard to security at all? Well, yeah, it is a secured access, so we had to go and approach the security. We didn't. We wanted to make sure that they didn't alert anybody we were coming, so we just said that we had a uh, notice to deliver. see it on this uh, certain images we just saw but was was Valerie at that time under arrest and handcuffed as well yes sir um, at some point he mentioned something about his cell phone his personal cell phone do you know whether or not that was ever recovered it was yes sir um, and the the phone that was 
being used to communicate with your undercover officer. Do you know if that was recovered as well? Uh, they're referring to the burner phone. Yes, yes sir, it was recovered. And uh, was that located in the back bedroom where, where he was attempting to go to get his underwear and all that? Yes, sir, it was. Um, how much, well, let me ask you this. At any point during that night, was Mac allowed to come and, and get his daughter from the, from the condo? Yes. Uh, I arranged it where I spoke with both parents, and I told them, we want this to be a normal transfer. I want that daughter not to be worried about anything. Did you make efforts to make the transition of that child as smooth as possible from Valerie to Mac? I did, yes, sir. Okay. And what did you do to ensure that? I talked to both parents. I asked them, please, just make it a normal handoff. Don't be yelling at each other. Don't ask each other any questions. Let's just bear in mind the girl and get it done, get it done nice, get it done quick. So despite the fact that Valerie McDaniel was under arrest at that time for solicitation of murder, uh, capital murder, was she unhandcuffed and allowed to wake her child up and hand that child off to that child's father? Yes, sir. So it would appear normal. Um, and sometime after what we see on the video uh, was a consent to search for the apartment. I am Lise Wheel for Long Crime. Get it nice to get and get it done quick. Get it nice and get, get it done this quick. That's effect. what the investigator said, the detective said. In Leon Jacobs' case, the uh, Houston doctor accused of murder for hire, not once, but twice, two people. And we've just seen the lead investigator walk us through this videotape. It's really sort of harrowing to see of the notification that the investigators gave to now the defendants. And of course, one of the defendants uh, did not stand trial for this case because she uh, killed herself. She committed suicide before before the case went to trial. I have with me again uh, my good friend here at Hay. Um, uh, in with me for a couple of bizarre cases that we're going to talk about. I guess we only saved the really bizarre cases for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an honorary I was, I sort was of in homicide when I was 26. As there a you go. Okay. So, my area so, of expertise. so what do you think about? We just saw sort of this, and it was kind of you know I guess it's sort of because it's in black and white, and it's it's strange to look at that. But what did you think about this notification, which was really I say notification because that's what it, they the posed to be, but it really wasn't. It was a notification uh, that really turned into arrest. They knew exactly what they were doing setting this up. And by the way, uh, Jacob set it up for an alibi saying, first, when he was there, he said, uh, when they saw him and notified him, they said, we've been here all night. Boom. He sets up an alibi when there was really no need to set up an alibi because they hadn't arrested him or accused him of anything. And listen, it's, they, the case against him is overwhelming. He's a very, he's a sociopath or a psychopath, whatever you call him. All those paths. He, he ruined that other woman, killed her, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Ruined the yeah. life of her daughter, yeah. right? Uh, and th there's Absolutely. just no, there's nothing you can say that encompasses how awful this person is, this doctor is. Well, and he's, in, he's a very well-educated guy. He didn't have to go, as we say, go into the street, which means do something wrong. And... Uh, I you know you watch these things. It's very depressing. I don't kind. Of, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I know guys that are killers, right? That's it. You give them money, they kill somebody. They kill other gangsters. They do. They hold up drug dealers. If the guy gets wise, they kill him. But this is a perfectly legitimate guy. What is he doing? He's got. They got children. They got lives. They got mothers. This guy's mother is. So what? You know what it does to his mother? You know, but that's again. You know, what a. In a murder for hire case, you have civilians, you have people that think that they have a problem. I had a case of a Boeing engineer, and he said, uh, he's going through a divorce, he said, I have a five foot four problem. His wife, I, Carla. Yeah. So that, you know, that's how it, and he went and that's tried to hire, murder for, uh, hire somebody to, to kill her. Um, yeah. So that's how they think now. It was, you know, this was a setup in the sense of a setup in, in, the, in the very best of words, in the sense that the, these two people were not killed and that they had the, the surveillance that we just saw. And you have then the best of outcomes, which is that the jury gets to see the notification, as chilling as that is, it's all been set up, the notification, the fake deaths, and the reaction from the defendant, which is, hey, I was here the whole time. Well, why would you say that when we hadn't accused you of anything? The other thing is somebody must get away with this kinds of stuff. It can't be that they get oh, they every do. person that does it. 
I mean, I it looks like they, they, these Russians are going to get away with what they did in England. And remember, in England, they killed, they poisoned not just the guy and his daughter. They, somebody killed his brother and his son. Right. Right. So that's too many coincidences. Well, and I had a case where you know, and this happens frequently, where the the killer, the murder for hire, is told to make it look like a drug deal gone bad. Right. So it wasn't really a drug deal but it was made to look like a drug deal gone bad, where that, that wasn't the motivation at all. But if you make it look right, like that, exactly. then the police aren't going to look much further. Right. You know, that's, oh, that's what it was. It was just a drug deal. Doesn't look any further than that to the real motivation of the what's going on. The other thing is a lot on. of times they kill the killer. What you do is you hire a guy to right. do a job, does it, and then you kill him. Right, and then, then, then your evidence, so to speak, is gone. Right. Oh, this is charming. We're going to go back to more of the Lee and Jacobs case, and we're going to go to his mother, because if anybody can say anything good about the defendant, um, and is rolling his eyes. But because I have you here, and I know you like these bizarre cases, we're going to take a little bit of a bridge between one bizarre case and talk about another. Now, your expertise, other than criminal law, is in civil procedure and civil law. So we're going to talk about a case that is kind of out of New Hampshire, kind of out of Rhode Island. It's focusing in Rhode Island right now in an insurance. Don't start yawning yet. Don't <laughs> yawn at all, because I can make insurance so interesting. Interesting, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sell you insurance, but I'm gonna talk to you about an insurance case, sort of, not really, but listen with me. An insurance case in Rhode Island right now, where a federal judge has just said that this guy, Nathan Carmen, a very as you see a picture of him, has got to answer questions in an insurance case about what happened to a gun that's been missing uh, since his grandfather's shooting in 2013. So his grandfather is shot to death in 2013, shot with a very particular gun, right? His mother then and he go off in a nice little sailing expedition um, in 2016 off Block Island where he, they get into a little bit of, well, more than a little bit of trouble. The boat sinks. Here comes the insurance claim. Boat sinks. He survives. You just saw the picture of him in court. He survives. Mom doesn't. So mom's body hasn't been found, but she's presumed to be dead. Go gone, dead. And so Nathan, charmer that he is, can you see I don't like this guy, <laughs> charmer that he is, files an insurance claim, right? Because he now wants to get his um, boat, you know, the, the payments for his boat um, from the insurance company. Insurance company says, not so fast, Nathan Bub, because we think you may have done some alterations on the, on the boat. Right. So we're going to contest this insurance claim that you're making. So How much is the claim, was it? You know, let's see. Uh, I don't even know the exact dollar amount on the claim, but I will get that for you. So the insurance company says, oh, by the way, the gun, is the particular gun, it's a SIG Sauer. It uses .308 caliber bullets. So that's a pretty, you know, serious interesting, gun. serious gun. Right. So, but he, but the, the, um, Nathan said that it's gone missing, don't know where it is, it's gone lost. Insurance company says, we're going to ask you about the gun, we're going to ask you all these questions about the boat, and this federal judge on, in Rhode Island says, yeah, insurance company, you need to know what happened with your boat, with the gun. All of that is fair game. The police now say, good on you, federal judge in Rhode Island. We're happy you're able to raise all these questions in the civil case because we, we couldn't get anything on the criminal case, though he was a suspect in the criminal case, but we couldn't get him to answer any of these questions. Well, He's so another. they may get around to the criminal case through the civil case, long-winded way of saying, I'm passing, o passing over to you. What do you think? This is a bizarre kind yeah, of case. First of oh, all, by the way, wait, wait, wait. One more thing we passed over to you. You know, sorry. you're great at I'm sorry. Wait a second. Wait a second. The, I got to tell you this. The name of the boat. I'm sorry. This is the best thing. The name. Who does this? The name of the boat that sank? Chicken pox. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, now Ed, over to okay. you. Okay, uh, this is another guy. I mean, he fires his lawyers. What is he? Nineteen twenty. So he's not going to be able to prepare himself properly for. He's not going to know how to conduct a trial. He's not going to be able to prepare himself properly for right. a deposition. Uh, and and, he's, I, and he threw yeah. mom overboard. I mean, there's something <laughs> wrong with this guy. Mom, no. Not under no. the train, but overboard. No. And he's and he's yeah. to say, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be a lawyer for myself. Right. Well, he's, you know, he's, he's arrogant. I mean, you know, kids, have you ever known a 19-year-old 
There's going to kill us. That's arrogant. No, 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 I wasn't going that far, but that says, you know, I could be a better lawyer than you. I didn't like my father, you. but I wouldn't have thrown him overboard to drown. Oh, boy. This is your mom, and she hasn't been recovered. And then, okay, then you add into the story. This is so much of the story. Then you add into the story mom's sisters, okay? Oh, and I forgot to mention, boy, this, I really have to get a lot into the story. Forgot to mention one little aspect of this case, which is that the grandfather, who has now been shot, Sorry for that, grandfather. With this, with this gun, is worth about. Wait for this. Twenty million dollars. So, son, who's the only heir of the mother now gone, his share would be about rough estimate five million dollars because he'd have to split it with his aunts, who are looking at him going, mm, not so sure about that. If you just killed our sister. And our and our father <laughs> throw all of that into the mix, and isn't it interesting though that it would all come down to whether or not he filed an insurance claim on a boat that he may have altered something with, and that's the why it's. You know, would you commit a murder where you could spend the rest of your life in jail for five million dollars? Forget about it. It's not worth it. You know, she. Oh, oh look at you coming down to dollars and cents. What about oh. the morality of killing your father <laughs> and then your, I mean, your grandfather and then okay, your mother? Okay, Lisa. All right. Yeah. You let's that think up. about okay. that. <laughs> In any case, this he's another. Uh, uh, I mean, well, look, we got the we got the murder for hire guy that's that's willing to kill two people for twenty thousand dollars and a couple of those fancy Cartier watches that I don't know anything about. Obviously, I don't know about watches. Well, whatever it is. We're having, a bit, we're having a particularly disgusting crew of defendants today. So yes. it, it makes it interesting for the viewers. I mean, it's... Uh... Oh, this is good stuff. And this case, we're going to be following this case. Uh, it's just been opened up by this Rhode Island judge who says, look, we're going to have this deposition. We're going to get possibly to a criminal case here. The criminal, uh, the, the criminal courts are watching because now Nathan has to testify in deposition about the gun that may have been the gun that was actually used to kill his grandfather. So we're going to be watching that one online. Long crime. Don't you worry. We're going to be we're going to be eyes on that one. But let's right now go back to now that we're starting the defense case in Leon Jacobs' case. And if anyone can say nice things about the defendant, because we have not been saying anything nice about him all day long here, it would be his mother. So let's see what his mother has to say. Golda Jacobs in the Leon Jacobs case. Um, are you aware of any? Uh, efforts on the part of Megan to uh, obtain money from you. Can you give me a time frame? Um, check the relevance again, Judge. Sustained. It's Hales. Yes. I'm Lise Wheel, back with the Leon Jacob case. Boy, Ed Hayes, we had uh, the mom there on the stand of the defendant, Leon Jacob, uh, Golda Jacob. Uh, you know, you've got the mother of the defendant, and you think for a second, what wouldn't a mother say to defend her but son? What really wouldn't also, she say? Wasn't she also the lawyer for the girlfriend? She's also a lawyer. She's also a family lawyer, right. And she um, was the lawyer for the girlfriend, wasn't she? she the girl that got killed herself. The, the, who committed suicide. Um, who also got a tremendous amount of money. But let's go back a second to her demeanor, if you wouldn't. For a, How would you assess the mother's demeanor on the stand I here? thought it was a pretty good witness, very forthright, uh, um, you know, intelligent. She, she was a pretty good witness. And by the way, what she said was not ridiculous. I mean, what she said was about a financial yep. motive involved. I mean, what you're really trying to do is you're, you're desperate. So you're trying anything. to throw anything. Right. So you're trying to throw something in that might make one. All you want to do is get a hung jury. You want to get one person on the jury that says, "Oh, I don't know. I can't. It's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt." And then you get a hung jury. You go back and say, "Hey, listen. Instead of giving them life, giving them 25 to life or something." Well, it was kind of. It was getting to a point where it was almost a sort of a, a blame the victim, kind of mounting to that oh, yeah. defense getting to be, you know, uh, 
she wanted him dead. You know, the other side wanted him dead. So it wasn't just a, a saying that it was a one-sided thing where the victim right. was, you know, this poor victim who we'd seen on the stand. It wasn't this poor victim, just that one-sided, but almost blamed the victim. The mother saying, well, she wanted him dead, meaning the victim here on this side wanted her son dead as well. And she had, uh, she had conversations with her son where she wanted him dead. It was on the other side. But then in cross-examination, we saw where the son, Leon Jacob, had sent emails to the mom saying, you know, expletive, get to put this person in place, all of that kind of thing. So on cross-examination, that was meted out. I still come back to the fact, though, that you've got a mother on the stand. I think any juror will put themselves in the position of, look, a mother would say... Anything. Almost anything to yeah, put, their, does, put their son on a good, it does in a good life. Though, Lisa. I mean, you know, I put the garbage guy on a stand. So anything to throw in there that can... Uh, can sort of create some kind of doubt. You're aiming for a hung jury. That's, well, that's all right. You're trying to that's do. right. You're aiming for a hung jury. And here, though, to try to get that hung jury, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, who are you going to call? Well, in this case, you're going to call the defendant himself, and that is your star witness, who we are going to see right now. That is Lee and Jacob taking the stand in the in the in the trial of a lifetime for himself. Here he is. Now, um... Can I re retract my last statement? It was not a continuous uh, relationship. We had had an interlude uh, in 2014, and then there was a long break where we were just friends. And then, you know, after... Um, I broke up with my former girlfriend. We rekindled the romantic rel part of the relationship. Okay. And your former girlfriend was who? Uh, a woman by the name of Megan Louise Veracus. All right. And you've heard Megan testify in this court? I have. All right. Now, uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about your relationship with Megan. When did you start? We met um, during my divorce proceedings. I lived in a couple of hotels in Pittsburgh. I lived in the Wyndham Grand for quite some time, and I decided to move hotels, and I was given a referral uh, to a place called the Cambria Suites. Uh, which was right next to the console center where the penguins play. And it, I checked in there, um, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2014, sometime in early January, and I met Meg. All right, you're hearing from Leon Jacob. He is his star, his own star witness, the defendant testifying in a criminal trial, which is it's kind of unusual. It doesn't happen all the time. This is the murder for hire plot, plot of the Houston doctor. Uh, Ed Hayes, who's here with me. Ed, uh, as I said, first of all, it doesn't happen every day that a defendant testifies for himself. He really almost had to here, though, because he was the one that was saying, sort of setting it up that I didn't do it. I wouldn't have planned for this. I was entrapped. All of that. I never meant for anything, any harm to come to her. Um, my my ex-wife and anybody else, I only meant to get back together with her or anything. What do you take so far from his demeanor, the way he's it's presenting not himself? It's not bad. I mean, he's, he comes across kind of flat. He's got a, a pretty dignified background. Like I say, your only aim is to get one juror to say, I'm not sure. The evidence against this guy is overwhelming, uh, and you're just hoping for something that you're hoping for a break, you know. But how does he surmount the evidence? He doesn't. In this, <laughs> well, <laughs> the case looks hopeless to me. But you do. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, okay. Now, but but play defense here because you have done you have, you have not just played it. You have done it very well no. in the courtroom. You got this case, and this guy is your star witness because you really you, right. you've seen the mother, 
and she did all right. But as you and I both said, um, I think the jurors will and bring their common sense to that and realize a mom is just about going to say just about anything to protect her son. Now you've got the guy there. He looks a little bit to me, I mean, he's so understated and so quiet. We had to like lean in to hear what he has to say that he's, you know, he almost looks sedated at a certain point. He um, may, may be. So Maybe. They, I mean, he does realize that. I mean, that's, he may have felt that he may be taking drugs in the mornings before his testimony. So he, he would. Yeah. But whatever it is, my opinion is the evidence against him is overwhelming. He's a very, very sick person, uh, and they, they're desperate. Yeah. They and then when you're are. desperate, you do desperate things. And putting a desperate thing is putting this jerk on a stand. And <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. All right. Well, we know what Ed thinks about this guy. Uh, but let's give him a chance to see what how he plays out uh, his true personality and what his story is and how that plays out on the stand. Because he's going to tell us in his own words, as we'll hear next. Let's hear go back to Leon Jacobs on the stand in his own words. Tell me. And the 10,000 went to Aziz as opposed to Megan? That was how it was arranged, yes. I was under the impression that Aziz was uh, in contact with Megan um, on a semi-regular basis. Well, but my question is, was the money given to Aziz for Aziz or to be given to Megan? It was to be given to Megan. The monies that were given to Aziz for Aziz were the initial $2,500 that he received plus the additional $5,000 for what I thought were his services. Do you know if, in fact, he gave money to Megan for this purpose? I have learned um, in testimony f that we've heard in court that that did not occur. Did what? It did not. I'm Lise Wheel with Law and Crime. So we've got Leon Jacob, the man accused of double murder for hire. Thank goodness the intended victims were not killed. He's on the stand testifying for himself. And in, in answer to the question, did you intend to uh, act, have anybody killed when you were talking to the hitman that he says now, no, it wasn't a hitman, it was a private investigator. He says, I never asked to have anybody hurt, harmed, or kill. That wasn't the money that was being spent. I wasn't spending it for that. I was just spending it for uh, installment of uh, expenses for the investigator to be uh, paid for for these expenses. Ed Hayes, what did you make of the testimony? First of all, I think you're a terrific anchor woman. Oh, goodness. You're Can charming, we get that? Let's get that on there. You're attractive, and personable. Well, okay, and thank you. Knowledgeable. Okay, so thank you. So it's a pleasure. I'll come on your show anytime you all want. All right. Ed, Other than you. that, I think he's a nut. He's a, uh, a psychopath. They're desperate to keep him from life in prison. Yeah. And like I say over and over, they're just hoping some juror will go back and say, oh, he seems like a nice kid. Right. Why would a doctor commit this kind of crime? I'm not going to convict him. That's it. It's the whole case. That's right. Just to get convinced one person on that jury. to get jury. one person to hang the jury. Or at least, if not to convince that one person, at least to make yeah, them doubt. think. Uh, would some some this upstanding young man really right. throw everything away right. and does and could is it plausible that that money for was for a private investigator? But here's I think what's but one other yes. thing. Not only does he do it, takes the risk for himself. He he brings in his girlfriend, right, right, who he barely knows to, in this plot too. I mean, that's what he's doing. Okay. What's going to be interesting, I think, and hasn't come up yet because we haven't gotten to cross-examination, is what else, you know, is going to be brought out on those tapes. Because he says, you know, and I think, what, I, I'm assuming what is going to come out on cross-examination, he also says at one point that he wants his ex-girlfriend injected with potassium chloride to stop her heart. I mean, don't forget, Ed, this is a doctor, right? He knows or would know exactly how right. to... Right. have that kind of murder done and a doctor also would not maybe want to dirty his hands so much i mean this case is fascinating and we're gonna have to close out the show my friend ed and thank you so much for your kind comments i would i love having you as a guest i hope you'll come back and join us on long crime I we've, got, good clothes. we've got to end it for today but we will be back tomorrow bright and early please join us when tomorrow, Leon Jacob takes the stand again. Remember, this is the defendant himself taking the stand. He is on trial for a double murder fire. We'll see you tomorrow here at Law and Crime. See you tomorrow.